that time of the week again. It's rolled around. Time to have a think. Time to reflect. It's time for another show from Colin Jones, the reasonable adventurer. Time for you to take another step towards creating your own opportunities for satisfaction. And it's a huge welcome to you all to episode 96 of The Reasonable Adventurer. I've been having a bit of an up and down week and uh, really looking forward to having this conversation with you today. Um, I want to sort of go back and have a chat to you about the last 20 hours. It's been a very interesting 20 hours. But to really set the scene for that, I most probably need to go back just a little bit in time, and just to give you a bit of a, uh, I suppose a bit of an understanding of the context within which the, the events of the last 24 or 20 hours have occurred in. So we've got a new unit happening here at QUT, and within this unit we're trying to achieve um, self-directed learning, transformational learning, and doing things in a different way relative to what the students have typically been used to. So it's been quite an interesting process and um, I've been trying to, uh, I suppose, bring into play um, a sort of a process of giving students information that they need to get in and work with as opposed to putting everything on a platter and just saying, just do this and know that and then you'll be okay. And by and large, the feedback hasn't been too bad. And um, it was quite interesting because uh, last night I, I met up with a, a colleague from a, from another institution. We were having a drink and uh, uh, it was my turn to go up to the bar and he was drinking Kilkenny, as it turns out, which meant that, you know, I'd be up there for five minutes while, you know, while they poured the drink. And so while I was waiting, I pulled out my phone and um, there was the initial feedback for the unit uh, at the three week mark and I thought okay let's um let's have a quick look see how that sort of shapes up and um the numbers weren't anything special much would be lower than I would normally expect um and um, there were some lovely comments uh, students are very happy with the way things were going but there were a bunch of students who were very unhappy with the way things were going and you, you normally expect a couple but there was much really more than a couple. There was five or six that had, you know, were on this sheet. And given that it was only like 18 students that had responded out of the 300, um, you know, you look at the numbers and it's disappointing because they, you know, they represent them as a number. You sort of know it's, you know, seven or eight percent of the students who have actually responded. But nevertheless, the comments are there, and the comments were, you know, pretty damning, really. And I took a quick look at them and I thought, wow, someone's written a whole paragraph, not a little one, a big paragraph about how much they're not enjoying the unit and the educational experience. And, um, you know, it's a weekend unit and that uh, clearly hasn't sort of um, struck a chord with everybody. And um, so I remember taking my beers back and I was slightly distracted for the rest of the evening, thinking to myself, gosh, that's, you know, that doesn't look good. And I got on the train and headed home and read through their comments and thought, wow, I've really upset these people in the way that I've organised this and and the like. And, you know, I came home and went to bed and same thing. You know, it's just on the back of my mind. I'm thinking to myself, gee, you know, maybe I've taken things in the wrong direction. Anyway, uh, working at home today, I had the opportunity to uh, really get stuck into catching up on assessing the reflections that the students are doing. All right, so we've got this initial experience that the students have done at the end of week three, and then there's some reflections that they're required to do, and the first one's about their entrepreneurial self. Um, and the reflections have been unbelievable. Unbelievable. You know, I've been working with Reflections now since about 2004, and uh, it's really interesting to look at the evolution of the process that I've been using to get students to reflect in. And uh, this year, as a result of students last year having some difficulties, I've built a different level of scaffolding around the process that sort of helps guide the student through that process. And, you know, the students still got to put themselves into it, but there's a 
maybe a, a, a surer way of being able to sort of navigate that space for the students. And they've really taken to it wonderfully. And it's just been a joy, just a joy to read these reflections. Unbelievable. As the morning wore on and I was reading more and more reflections and giving more and more students 10 out of 10 because they just nailed the process, and that's what I'm assessing, the process, it started to dawn on me that, gee, you know, I've now done more than half of the class. I've done 150 um, assessments over the last couple of weeks, um, and, and, and they're fantastic. I haven't come across anybody who seems grumpy, you know. Those ones I, I suspect are still to come. You know, maybe they're just sort of sitting back and waiting. And then I started to realise that, you know, maybe over the last 20 hours, I've been thinking and putting a little bit too much weight on these angry, loud voices. And that I should have most probably had more faith and confidence in the quiet voices that I'm able to listen to when I read through these reflections. So that was a really interesting sort of... um, I don't know if realisation is the word. I think it's more, you know, you just get jolted back into that space where you think, don't give up, have have this faith, right? And, you know, at the end of the day, you can't be all things to all people. It's not possible that you can have 300 students and have everyone saying, it was fantastic, right? Um, you know, it's it's highly unlikely, you know, because there's a myriad of reasons why a bunch of students, a handful of them, I'm just not going to engage with the unit, you know, regardless of how it's done. So I found this a really, really interesting process. But nevertheless, I know there are students out there who aren't enjoying it, right? And so there's this little pebble that's in my shoe. That, you know, it's there. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, right, you know, <laughs> this is annoying me, right? So that sort of takes me back many, many years ago, because the unit runs again very soon in semester two. And so it's like, okay, is there something you can do? Is there something that you can do to eliminate, reduce, overcome the nature of any of these issues? And I think part of it, and you know, quite ironically, I spent yesterday with some of the ed education technologists at our work uh, were very well sort of catered for in that area thinking about the interface that the students are using so I'm using quite a primitive way of doing it and looking at some really cool ways of being able to help the students again be scaffolded to understand the nature of the journey that I'm looking for them to go on not just in reflecting but across the various activities and organization of the unit so I can sort of see well that can improve itself Uh, clearly I need to um spend even more time than I have on helping students to understand the the contextual nature of the unit. But it took me back to about 2004, 2005, when I was playing this game and uh, I had a few students who were very upset, very vocal about the game. And I knew I had to create some change in the unit uh, around this game but I was a little bit unsure what to do. I could listen to the noisy minority and just take the game out, right? But I was still unsure, and I was quite excited by the game, and I could see excitement in the room about the game, right? But I could see it was not working for people. And um, I remember watching this video of uh, how to teach the Harvard case study method, and in this video uh, that I have, the guy talks about this process that he used to use where he would give students a piece of paper and he'd write three words on the piece of paper. You know, add, keep, remove. And I thought, I'll do that. So I gave my students this piece of paper, blank, you know, essentially blank with three words on it. At the top, add. What do we need to add to this unit to improve it? What do we need to keep in this unit to, to you know, improve it? What do we need to get rid of? right, to improve it. And I let, you know, the add bit could be modify as well, yeah. Um, And it was really, really interesting, right? Yeah, 
there were definitely people who said, get rid of that game, I hate it, right? It's based on luck, I don't like luck. And then there were other people who just thought that the way the game was being played just didn't make as much sense as it could, right? But there was this huge amount of students, let's say there was uh, 80 students in the class, there was like 50 or 60 students who were saying, love the game, keep the game, it's fantastic. So you get this data in front of you, which is representative. It's essentially a census of the class, right? And it's like, okay, so I've got five people who hate it and 60 who love it. How can the five dictate as we go forward? How do we take on board their concerns, though? Is there a different way? And so we made a change to the game. We, instead of playing the game in the class and discussing it out of the class, we used to meet fortnightly and there was a self-directed gap in between the fortnightly classes. We did it the other way around. We discussed the game in the class and played it outside the class, right? And it, it seemed to fix the major problems that people had. It didn't fix the way people perceive the nature of luck being attached to assessment, but that actually is the whole point of the game. Um, but it certainly improved the majority of problems students have with the game. So I feel quite excited now. I think, okay, all right, you know what? I know I've got some negative feedback and I know that there are aspects to this that are a problem. And some of them, I suspect I may not be able to fix for the next cohort, right? But some of them I'm sure I can fix, right? About the way information is um, generated about the unit, about the way that that journey is uh, communicated to them so they can better understand it. And so I'm looking forward to our last class. When we have our last class, I'm looking forward to handing out that piece of paper and saying to students, well, here is your opportunity, right? But instead of getting a small sample back where there's some red negative comments and there's some green positive comments and being confused about these two outlying situations, you know, some who say, this is unbelievable, fantastic, and these who say, this is unbelievably bad, and not being able to really make sense about that, I'm going to fill in the middle. I'm going to see just how fat people's preferences are. And I'm going to try and elicit suggestions on how we could improve aspects of the unit. So I'm really, really excited to be able to do this, right? Because it's what I've done in the past. It means the students are actually having this real say, increases my confidence in terms of being able to sort of react to it. But it also stops me from throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It also stops me from over-evaluating the negative comments or basking in the glory of some positive comments, right? Because it's the stuff in the middle, right? The big, you know, the really fat stuff that matters. If there's a really fat, constant, um, you know, 300 students, if there's 100 who say they hate something, well, that's a real problem. If there's four or five who really hate it, well, maybe you can't ever get around the four or five, but maybe you can take the edge off something that's uh, problematic, right? So that's where I'm at. I'm feeling great, right? I'm feeling great that the transformational nature of the unit that I've set out to do is happening, right? I've got a book on my shelf by Marcia Baxter McGolder. It's called Making Their Own Way, right? And it charts this journey of these students and, and communicates the nature of these students via their reflections. And I'm so excited right now. I'm so, I've, I don't think I've been this excited for a long time. When I think about the nature of the, these reflections that I'm reading, and I'm thinking, wow, this is just like I'm watching a whole field of flowers opening up in front of me. Yeah, there's a couple that didn't open, right? That's not going to stop me seeing the rest of the colour and smelling, you know, the fragrances that are coming my way. And it's got me excited about the next one, you know, the next. And I'm saying to the students when I'm giving them their assessment, you know, fantastic work. Can't wait to read your next reflection, right? Because I'm thinking, wow, if that's their first go at doing it and that's where they got to and they get this positive feedback, 
Where are we going to get to in a few weeks' time when they do the second one? And then where are we going to get to when we get to the third one? I reckon that's fantastic, you know. I'm so, so excited, right, to be able to sort of see this little journey. And then what it enables me to do is to go into next semester with this much, much higher level of confidence, right, in terms of knowing that this process can produce those outcomes, right? Even though the students are finding their own way through it in in their own different ways, right? And the reason why I can have this confidence is because I'm able to listen to those quiet voices, yeah? So think about that in your world. When do you listen too loudly or too intently to the loud voices? Have you been able to quantify the significance of those loud voices, right? Are they just problematic because of the loudness, right? Sure, I'm very flawed in in most of the things that I do. So I'm a pretty easy target. If someone criticizes me, I can see their reasoning. I can see that there's a validity to it, right? But does that mean that they're 100% right for everyone? Is it a representative concern that's being raised? Or is it really unavoidable when you're trying to do things different? Yeah, When you're doing things differently, when you're actually out there really challenging people in a context where that may not always be the case, right? So I'm excited. I can't wait to see what we're going to get in a few weeks' time. And I'm really excited about listening to these quiet voices. I wonder what quiet voices there are out there around you that you can tap into. I wonder what voices are out there that you can not ignore, but try and find a strategic way to pay attention to And to accept that you can't be all things to all people, but you can improve, but there's a limit to how far you can improve. Look forward to talking to you soon. Cheerio.